Noah. Adam was the first adopted son of God. Due to Adam's sin and the increasing intensity of sin, both by those of the line of Seth and those of the line of Cain, God sent a great flood to destroy mankind, except for Noah, his family, and the animals protected by the ark. After the flood, Noah became a new Adam, and in a, in a sense, the new first adopted son of God as a just man and just father. As an imperfect fulfillment of the first Adam, Noah prefigures Jesus Christ, the first and only son of God, eternally begotten by the Father. Jesus is also the perfect savior of the world as the new Adam and the new Noah, who is the originator of the new creation of grace under the new covenant. When Noah is seen as prefiguring Christ, as a type of Christ, then the various aspects of his life can be spiritually interpreted as fulfilled in Christ. This is precisely what St. Peter does with, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from your body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3, 20-21. Echoing St. Peter's spiritual interpretation, St. Augustine describes a flood which wiped out the sinful descendants of Adam as fulfilled in baptism, which similarly washes away sin, but differently from the flood, offers us salvation in the way that the flood of old did not. The 40 days the flood lasted and 150 days, Genesis 7, 4, and 8, 3, that the water reached its maximum height in which Noah's and his family's trust in God was tested, anticipates Jesus' 40 days in the desert where he was tempted by the devil's suggestions. These 40 days of Noah are echoed by Moses' fasting for 40 days in Mount Sinai and the Israelites' 40 years in the desert. They also related to the prophet Elijah's 40 days of fasting on Mount Sinai, to name just a few Old Testament biblical references. The dove that returns to Noah, signaling that the flood is sufficiently receded, anticipates the Holy Spirit, interprets St. Jerome, among other church fathers. The Holy Spirit is not only associated with the cleansing waters of baptism, but also with fire, as indicated in Acts chapter 2 when describing Pentecost. St. John Chrysostom compares this fiery presence of the Holy Spirit to the burning bush that Moses saw, that rather, that rather being consumed by the fire became transformed by the fire while keeping its form. God keeps his promise to Noah to never again to flood the world with the destructive force of water. This is evident, as explained by Petri and Han, by the Hebrew word for rainbow, Kesheth. Kesheth means both a rainbow and a bow used to kill men in war or animals when hunting. Due to this double meaning, the rainbow has been interpreted, explains Han, as a sign that God will no longer make war against humanity. God hangs up his war bow and retires it from service, or as a bow drawn and aimed at heaven, a symbolic threat that represents God's covenant oath. End of quotation. God has kept his oath not to destroy mankind with a flood of water. Petrie, Petrie points out that this does not mean that God will not purify mankind by other means. According to scripture, God will sound out his Holy Spirit in full force at the end of time to bring forth a new heavens and a new earth. Those who are not living on earth during the second coming of Christ will be transformed by fire in purgatory, as St. Paul states, I quote, For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. St. Peter even explicitly compares the flood of Noah to Jesus' second coming at the end of time. The world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist have been stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction. 
The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved by fire, and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. Heavens will be kindled and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire. But according to his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 2 Peter 3, 6-13 The ark that protected Noah, his family, and the animals from the flood has commonly been interpreted as representing the church. The early bishop of Carthage, St. Cyprian, writes, The one ark of Noah was a type of the one church. St. Augustine furthers this typology by spiritually interpreting the various aspects of the ark. For example, the door of the ark is compared to the side of Christ that was pierced with the spear, and out of which blood and water flowed, representing the sacramental church. In accordance with this typology, Bishop Barron reminds Catholics that we're not to stay in a protective ecclesial environment, but rather, as Noah and his family exited the ark and then set about restoring order to the world, we are called to go out into the world, proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, so that people will order their many loves around this source of all love, God. In addition, the central way by which we are to bring order to a fallen world is represented by what Noah did shortly after disembarking from the ark. He worshiped God and offered sacrifice on the mountain of Ararat from the seven pairs of animals, distinguished from the non-numbered pair of animals that he had provided shelter from the flood. We are to worship God by participating in the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ through the celebration of the Most Holy Eucharist, the font and apex of the whole Christian life, as Vatican II states. The Eucharist in the fulfillment of the Garden of Eden, Tabernacle and Jerusalem Temple is to be the focal point around which we are to reorder a fallen world to God. God responds to Noah by establishing a covenant with him. As Petrie indicates, the first time God makes a covenant with Noah before the flood in Genesis and with all of creation is the first time that the Hebrew word for covenant, berith, is used in the Old Testament explicitly. Although the reality of the word berith points to is implied in the earlier relationships God established with all of creation and with Adam and Eve, Representing tradition, the Catechism the Catholic Church teaches that the covenant with Noah remains in force during the times of Gentiles until the universal proclamation of the gospel. End of the co- end of quote. It is important to note that this covenant precedes the covenant of God later makes with the Hebrew people, whose first father, patriarch, is Abraham, and from these people with Israel, whose father is Jacob, also called Israel, after he wrestled with the angel. God's reaffirmation of the Noah covenant in Genesis chapter 9 reads, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you. The covenant God makes with Noah, a Gentile, is a covenant that applies to all people who in some way are descendants of the nations which descended from Noah identified in Genesis chapter 10. Among these nations are the descendants of Noah's son Shem, who, as traced by the Bible, is the father of the Semitic, Shemitic people, and consequently the father of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the Israelites. Due to being after the fall, when all humankind had been touched by sin, the true the two previously mentioned cities once again emerge and vie with one another. As a reminder, These two cities are the city of man or the city of death, characterized, explains Augustine, by excessive self-love, and a city of God, a city of life ordered by love of God. Both cities try to persuade the other city's citizens to switch their allegiance. As salvation history unfolds in time, God chooses one nation, the Israelites, so that through this choice, all the members from the other nations may be gathered slowly back to God, in the city of God, in the city of life, whose essential focus is worship and love of God, 
and its corresponding ordered love of neighbor. In teaching on this principle of Genesis that God chooses in salvation history to call one nation, Israel, for the sake of the other nations, the Catechism teaches, I quote, After the unity of the human race was shattered by sin, God at once sought to save humanity part by part. The covenant with Noah after the flood gives expression to the principle of the divine economy towards the nations, in other words, towards men grouped in their lands, each with its own language, by their families in their nations. In order to gather together scattered humanity, God calls Abram from his country. After the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as fathers of Israel, God formed Israel as his people. Israel is the priestly people of God, called by the name of the Lord, and the first to hear the word of God, the people of elder brethren in the faith of Abraham.